Hey everybody, I'm the Drink Pro. Today I'm drinking Orphan Barrel Forager's Keep. What's up everybody, Kyle the Drink Pro here with you yet again. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you for liking my content, sharing it with your friends, and becoming a member of Patreon. Now is the time to become a patron of the Drink Pro channel. Uh, we've got some really cool things coming up in the near future and you may have an opportunity to win some allocated bourbon. Gotta check it out, patreon.com slash the drink pro. Today, I'm going to be trying something a little bit different from my normal review. I do a lot of bourbon reviews on this channel, but today I've got a Speyside whiskey. And I'll give you a little bit more information about what that is. I think a lot of people who watch this channel are more familiar with bourbon than scotch. And I gotta tell you, there are some really cool things in the scotch world. I'm not sure if this is one of them yet or not, but Speyside in particular is a good place for people who might enjoy just a hint of something different but they still liked a lot of classic bourbon flavors. Now with scotch, you have to really know what region the whiskey is from to have a better understanding of what it is. A lot of people think of bourbon and Kentucky as being married, even though you can get bourbon in a lot of different places. Well, in Scotland, there's sort of a similar thing going on. There's whiskey made in a lot of different locations, but the region kind of gives you a sense of what you're going to get. So the five different regions are Campbelltown, Isla, the Highlands, the Lowlands, and Speyside. Those five regions make up the central locations where Scotch whiskey is made. What are those five and what do you get from those areas? The most common one, and I think the thing bourbon drinkers are the most afraid of from Scotch is that smoky peatiness. That's gonna come from your Isla Scotches. Now, I wanna be careful here. There is a little bit of sort of, you know, generalizing that I'm doing to come up with these categories and explain the flavors in the areas. But generally speaking, Islas are gonna be very smoky, pea, earthy, not something for everybody, frankly. Campbelltown, I kind of put in a similar category. Campbelltown is going to be a little bit more briny, maybe. Uh, smoke and brine and this sort of sea salt, interesting note. It can be a challenging flavor profile for people. It's gonna have a little bit more of the fruitiness than you're gonna get from an Isla, but it's still something that may challenge a bourbon drinker more than they really want to be challenged, especially right out of the gate into their scotch introduction. Now, most of the bourbon drinkers that I know who also end up liking scotch got their start in scotch through Speyside whiskeys, which is kind of interesting because Speyside whiskeys tend to still have a little bit of peat in them. Now, again, these are generalizations, but a lot of Speyside whiskeys will give you hints of a salty note, hints of an earthy note. They're just much more subtle than your Campbelltowns or your Islas but they're also gonna bring in a lot of interesting fruit flavors. So you're gonna get this sweetness, this fruitiness, but then you're also going to pair that with that sort of classic scotch profile in most people's minds. When people think of a scotch profile, that's probably where they go. Uh, the other two regions, the Highlands and the Lowlands, some of their stuff may be peated, but a lot of it has no peat whatsoever. So there's none of that smokiness, none of the saltiness, none of the iodine, no medicinal flavors, that's all gone. Now there's sort of two main characteristics with Lowlands whiskey that are often uh, repeated again and again and again. You're gonna have a lighter whiskey. It's gonna be a little bit um, more gentle on the palate. And you're also going to have herbal flavors and floral flavors, as opposed to such a strong fruit note, which you might get from a space side or from the Highland. Now the Highland is probably the most varied region in terms of the profiles you'll get from whiskeys in those areas, but it, tends to, in my mind, lean towards a fruitier pour um, without as much peat. Again, that's a generalization. There's a huge variance in the Highland flavors, probably more than any other region. But when I think of Highland, that tends to be where my mind goes. A short-lived distillery in Speyside region, Pitivok, is the source of Forager's Keep. Now, this distillery only existed for about 18 years. It was uh, disbanded in 1993. But this whiskey and many other whiskeys like it come from their barrels and are aged actually longer than the distillery existed. There's always some debate about super aged whiskey, but with scotch, I tend to find it's more enjoyable because the more temperate climate in Scotland means you're not digging as far into the wood like you would with a bourbon or uh, even some whiskeys in Kentucky, Texas, Nevada, places where they get even hotter than your standard bourbon pours you're not gonna get a lot of, of good flavors if you age something 20 years in those climates, typically speaking. Now this is a 26 year old single malt whiskey. That means it's from one distillery, Pitivok, and it's 100% malt. This particular pour is also at 48% alcohol. And it's important to note, this is not a single barrel. This is a blend of barrels. I think that's particularly important because when you're talking about something that's this aged, I would expect a lot of variance 
in the profile. Some might be much woodier than others. Some might be much sweeter than others. It can be a real crapshoot, frankly. One other thing I'll note about this pour is it's $400 a bottle. It's a pretty high price point, but I think part of it's because this distillery doesn't exist anymore. Getting so-called lost distillery barrels is expensive and rare. People look for that kind of thing. Um, so you have to account for the story in the price point. I almost guarantee it's not going to be worth $400 just on the palate but you're buying it for more than that. You're buying it for the story, you're buying it to own a piece of history, and you're buying it to have something that no one else can ever have again. This will never exist again. Now, while I'm pouring this out, I'm gonna go ahead and thank Mark Goldman for this whiskey. Uh, Mark has been patiently waiting for me to try a couple of the pours that he sent me, so I will be trying them over the next couple of weeks. If you guys have whiskeys that you want me to review, please feel free to send them in. Uh, I can put my address at the bottom of the screen here. You know, that's a great place you can send them in. Uh, just, just let me know and we can talk about it if there's any questions. Now, this is a great example of why scotch is different than bourbon in terms of the aging process. Look how light that is. 26 years in a barrel. One of the reasons that a lot of times scotch has caramel coloring added is because it's so light, even with a lot of age on it. That's not a function of, you know, good flavors not being imparted from the wood into the whiskey. It's just the process is very different and people tend to think of dark, rich colors being valuable, but that's not always that important. I tell you what, on the nose, this is very classic Speyside. And by that, I mean, I get just a hint of this peaty smokiness, just a hint of this sort of salty sea breeze. And then some beautiful, I would say uh, maybe like a pear or a light fruit underneath it. Kind of fun, I definitely get sort of a raisin and dried apricot note. There's this weird dried fruit quality. I definitely still get the fresh uh, pears and maybe even some fresh apple, but the dried fruit is really fun and curious to me. The more I smell this, I also get this really sweet floral note. Uh, honeysuckle is something I pull from a lot of different whiskeys, I think because I like uh, the idea of this sort of honey floral combination and it really hits something in the right spot in my mind. And this is no exception. I'm definitely getting honeysuckle. As I keep smelling this, the nose starts to also give me some sort of like orange a lot of citrus fruit, uh, honey and citrus fruit is very prominent on this. And when I first started, I said, you know, the first thing I smelled was that hint of peat and that hint of sea breeze. One of the things for me that's very classic Speyside is some of those notes take a back seat as you spend time with the whiskey. Initially, right up front, you're gonna get that sea breeze, maybe slightly peaty note, very much like standing, smelling the earth, looking out at the ocean, but it dissipates and then you start to move inland. <laughs> I have this sort of narrative in my mind. You start to move inland and you get to this wonderful fruit and flower orchard. I would say I also get a really slight note of like pencil shavings. I know that's another weird note, but there's this sort of woody, dry, uh, almost like processed wood vibe I get on the nose of this. I'm also getting just a hint of maybe like a marzipan, some sort of sweet, nutty kind of thing going on. I love the nose on this. All right, let's go ahead and give it a taste. Ooh, you know you're drinking scotch with that. Wow. Whew. Yeah, there's no mistaking this. It is peaty on the palate. Wow, a lot peatier than I expected, to be honest with you, after that nose. The nose had hints of this salty peatiness, but it was much more fruity and citrus, hints of floral notes, hints of this sort of sugary nuttiness thing going on, but wow, the flavor is very undeniably smoky peaty. See, but this is why you do multiple tastings. Just like with the nose, the first thing I tasted was all that peat just blew me out of the water. Second taste, I get a little bit more nuance and complexity. Uh, the nuttiness starts to come out on the finish. So initially I just could only get that earthy peatiness on the finish, but now I'm starting to see almost an almond character and a little bit of uh, like old, you know, half rotted wood, uh, not in a gross sense, but in a sort of boggy sense. So on that third tasting, the floral notes are really starting to show up. I'm still not getting very much fruit. I'm getting a little bit of sweetness, but it's not fruitiness. It's sweet like honey, it's sweet floral. And then I'm getting this weird herbal, almost like grass clippings quality in the mid palate. Uh, definitely the a classic scotch note not something you're gonna see in bourbon. And frankly, something that may turn off some bourbon drinkers. One thing that uh, kind of gave me pause about this brand is Orphan Barrel does a lot of things in the bourbon world. And, you know, that's great. They're making really cool, super-aged bourbon products, but 
if you're going to keep that as your branding and then you bring in an old peaty scotch, you're going to be challenging a lot of your own supporters. Uh, maybe that was on purpose. Maybe that was their intention as they said, all right, well, we're going to throw you guys for a loop. I don't know. Ooh, now I'm getting some fruity notes. It, it's much more like fruit peel. So I get like orange peel and lemon zest. It's, it's the bitterness. There's a sweetness, this fruitiness, and this bitterness that are all kind of coalescing right off the bat on the palate. I kind of like this. Uh, I think I'm much more receptive to peatiness and smokiness than a lot of bourbon drinkers. But, you know, this is really cool to me because it's so complex. And part of that is definitely going to be 26 years in a barrel. Like, that's enough time for some really cool things to happen to a whiskey. And because it's not so rapidly aging like a bourbon, it doesn't become overpowered with that, you know, oaky, dry, tannic quality that can really turn people away at a certain point. Some people really seek that out, but at a certain point, it just ruins everything else in the whiskey. All of the other nuance and complexity is gone, and now you're just left with dry wood tannins. I don't always want that. Actually, I almost never want that, but some people like that, up to a point. You're not going to get very many 25-year-old bourbons, though, or 26-year-old bourbons. It's just not going to happen because by that time, they're going to be so woody and so tannic with that virgin oak, which is another thing. These are going to be in used barrels, so it's going to change the aging process. Yeah, the smokiness on this is a little bit more of a bonfire than like a uh, iodine medicinal smoke or like a meaty smoke. I always get meaty smoke from Lagavulin and more of that uh, sort of iodine smoke from Ardbeg. But this kind of reminds me more of the Laphroaig style of smoke, at least for me personally. But while it reminds me of the Laphroaig smokiness, it's a lot quieter. There are a lot of other notes that are more prominent that are sort of reminding me that this is a Speyside whiskey. There's that sweetness, there's that honey, there's the little bits of nuttiness, uh, and very particularly the floral notes, and maybe even this herbal grass note that I don't often get personally, again, from Isla. I get a little chocolate in the mid-palate and finish as well. Honestly, I could explore this whiskey for a long time. There's so much going on. It's so complex. I could be pulling notes out for 30 minutes worth of video, and I don't really want to do that. <laughs> um, not just because I don't want to edit 30 minutes worth of video, but, uh, you know, I think at a certain point it gets repetitive. You get the point. There's so many different notes in it. It's incredibly complex. That's really cool. This is not a pour for everybody. This is a pour for somebody who wants to see what kinds of interesting complexities come out of 26 years in oak. And they also want to own a piece of history. I think maybe that's the most important component here is you have to really want to relate back to this lost distillery. Pity Vac is not going to make any more whiskey. It's done. It's forever gone. So the reason you're paying $400 for this bottle is to own that history. Yes, it's a good whiskey. Yes, it's complex. Yes, it's 26 years old. But at the end of the day, I don't think it's worth $400, even with all those, you know, caveats. But the thing that makes it worth buying is you're buying a bottle from a lost distillery. That's really cool. It's great to own a piece of history. So I finished what's in my glass, but I think I'm going to pour the rest of the sample bottle. I really dig it. Again, it's not for everybody, but... Uh, if you want to kind of explore what 26 years in Oak in Scotland will look like, this is the place to go. In the meantime, y'all keep drinking like professionals. <laughs> Cheers.